Hey, everybody. So today, we're going to be reviewing Across the Spider-Verse. I know it's been like three weeks since this movie came out, but I finally got a chance to watch it on Slogside with Berman and Daniel. So this is going to be a spoiler video. So if you don't want to hear any spoilers about the movie, um, I don't know what to tell you, man. Go watch something else. But in the meantime, yeah. Well, in the meantime, what did you guys think about it? Great movie for me. And you I'll say this. I think that is up is up there with No Way Home as the best um, Spider-Man movie to date. And good. it's a pretty good reel too. It's very good, and even if it has a uh, a abrupt end, but it was very good. The music and everything was awesome. And honestly, no complaints here. It was pretty solid from start to finish, just for the fact that it was pretty up there with the first Spider-Verse movie. Like, it was very enjoyable. But for me personally, I I know it's a two-parter, and we'll get to it later on and down this review. But I kind of felt like the ending was a bit of a cop-out when things were finally getting good. But we'll start at the beginning. So, Daniel, what did you think about the first part of this movie? Where get Gwen's backstory? So, I thought it was interesting you know and yeah i can't really say too much about it i feel like this film just doesn't really have anything wrong with it and yeah i think it's cool that it, uh, this film took the time to explore gwen's story more and you know it gets us invested in her more heading into this third and final film so yeah i appreciate all the work that went around that and you berman i think it was very interesting i actually it was super dark to see that how when when kind of got there, like where he pretty much, she pretty much killed Peter with by uh, the lizard when he was a lizard, but it still was interesting to hear to kind of hear the backstory a little bit. And I gotta say, I love the kind of the coloring in her dimension. The color in that dimension is really interesting. The nice whites, like a lot of more, like different type of colors. I, I really do love the dimension that she was into. So for me, I really liked it. And yeah, uh, apart from that thing. The, the only part of Gwen's, like, backstory is when we finally get introduced to her dad and we get Pasta Parker. I don't know if it was just me, guys, but initially when, when Gwen's dad just came up to her and discovered her identity, he just shot a pistol in there and he was like, bitch, if you don't stop resisting, I'm gonna cap you right now. And she's like, dad, don't. I have nobody else to go by. And it's like, that's too bad, Gwen. I'm a cop at the end of the day. But that, that could just be me just overthinking. I just thought uh, it kind of made me laugh really hard because it's just kind of silly. I can understand that critique. However, this is what I'll say. I think in like a situation like that, the dude just wasn't thinking. Either that or we, we probably already know this. He's kind of a shitty parent. What do you mean, dude? You don't just point pistols at your children when they're Spider-Man or Spider-Women? I don't know about that one. <laughs> you permit me? Um. I think it, I do understand kind of what do you think about it. was weird, but I do you guys have to I want to mention too that during that fight scene, I really loved it, that vulture. It's an interesting type of vulture that they put in there in the introduction of the Spider Man 20, 2099. Very, he looks very emo, kind of like an emo. And, and uh, was it Spider Woman? It was very funny how she wrote in, showed up, uh, Gwen saw the baby. Like, yeah, I'm pregnant, and then. Gwen says, uh, can you duck me? It just made me laugh. It was, that was a very funny part right there. So that was kind of a fun thing that I kind of saw there. And I also did that too. They also introduced great characters. Because I thought at first when this movie was going to come out, I was like, oh, it's going to be kind of like overshadowed by like all these Easter eggs. But no, I was actually caught by surprise because I'm going to look up his name because I want to make sure I get his name correctly. So give me one second. What, the uh, twenty Spider-Man 2099? Uh, no, the, the kid from India? Because he's really good. I gotta look up his oh, name. Oh, it's literally just Spider-Man India. Oh, he doesn't have a name? No, he doesn't no. have a name. He, he does have a name, like a real name, but most people would call him Spider-Man uh, Spider uh, India. Well, point being, he was probably alongside one of my favorite supporting characters just for the fact, you know, I never really, as dumb as it sounds, I never kind of heard of that kind of concept before for, you know, like a India-inspired Spider-Man. It was kind of cool seeing, like, you know, the suburbs where he's from, like his little girlfriend. And what have you. But his personality was really... I don't know. It kind of reminded me of like a really cocky Spider-Man. Like really teenager -y, Like how it kind of was in the comic books. But I really enjoyed his supporting role. 
for most of this film. It's, it's really good. I think all the supporting Spider-Man were really cool. From the cameo with Spectacular Spider-Man, that was fantastic. You also have, honestly, the fan favorite right now, Spider-Punk. And, yeah, I'm excited to learn more about Spider-Punk in the third film. I feel like we will learn more in the third film. And Spider-Punk was just a cool character. He was just that homie that just came in and helped whenever you needed him. Yeah, Renegade, I would say. I think, too, it's really funny that they showed the Spider-Man, the game, like the Spider-Man PS4 character like in the back. I mean, like, it was very funny to see that. So, but yeah, for me, Spider, uh, Spider-Punk was my all-time favorite. He was just a rebel. Like, it was very funny that... The accent was perfect. I will. That's still probably one of my favorite characters in this movie. Yeah. And the funny thing about just the, another cameo I want to mention, Childish Gambino is probably the cameo I appreciate the most of the entire movie. Because I don't know if you guys knew this, but Miles Morales was made because of Childish Gambino. Was he? He, yeah. The funny thing is Childish Gambino, like, was supposed to be Miles Morales, or that was like the idea that Miles Morales was made for Childish Gambino. So when they made him uh, have a, you know have a cameo in this movie as the Prowler, because that's what he was in Homecoming, you know, it was really cool to just see him get that cameo because that's like a little way of you know paying homage to the guy that gave us Miles Morales in the first place. Technically, now is Childish Gambino. Oh, and yeah. also, I, sorry, go ahead, Bermy. No, I'm just saying that, yeah, that's pretty interesting to hear. I also forgot to mention the spot. He was probably one of my favorite villains. <laughs> I think he was way better than the Kingpin from the last one because this guy just has such a, a grudge against Miles. He's like, you know what? You threw that bagel at me. You ruined my life. I'm going <laughs> to kill your dad. And I'm going to destroy the these, universe. <laughs> what's with these multiverse movies and bagels? <laughs> if you if you understand that reference, um, this, this film was also Everywhere at once. Yep. Everything ever all at once. You already know. There was even a billboard somewhere in the in the movie uh, for everything ever all at once. So that's actually really damn cool. And that kind of confirms that there is obviously some sort of inspiration within this film from that. But yeah, as great as Kingpin was in the first film, I think both Miguel and the Spot overshadow what Kingpin did in the first film. And yeah, like from the animation, everything. I just feel like the second movie is just better than the first film based off a technical scale, based off the stakes that are on the line, the story. And sure, sometimes they'd get a bit small uh, stakes for some people, too small stakes for some people, but for me, I don't really mind it because it's actually interesting to get more of an in-look on Miles as Miles. And you do get some of that in this film because I guarantee for the third film, it's probably just going to be him in this Spider-Man suit for 99% of it. So I feel like getting some in-look into Miles for this film was the right way to go about it. Even if people didn't love that take, I personally thought it was the right way to go. Yeah, I think I agree with that too. The spot was just so, it was one, it was, at first he was so hilarious and he was just made fun of the whole time. Then he became a super villain, like a Thanos level super villain. Like a, he was destroyer of everything. And it was super interesting. I think one of my favorite part, favorite scenes of the movie was when they were in India and they were in the particle accelerator you should know this one and he activated it and as soon as it turned as soon as the uh, the uh, particle accelerator blew up he turned completely black and he had the most creepiest look to him with like a swirl into his face and like swirl everywhere like he was just so creepy of a character and just looked so menacing in that scene and just and it just looks amazing for that scene in general. Yeah. yeah. But you know what the well, only yeah. thing, the only critique I have on the movie, and I, I understand we got to build Miles Morales, but his whole, like, him hiding his identity from his parents was kind of the only thing that I felt like that was dragging on. Because I, I get it, it's important, you can't really seek your identity. But with the scope of this movie... We could have just, like, saved that and not have to constantly bring it up, like, over and over and over. And I'm just, at some points, I was just like, I don't care. I don't care about his parents. I just want to see the other Spider-Verse people. Or, I don't know, that, that could be just, like, a little weird trick that I personally had with it. What about you guys? I think it is a weird thing you have, because 
honestly, giving them the screen time in this film matters because you need to care about everything and everyone heading into the third film. You already know quite a bit about the OG Six. You already know quite a bit about Point Ninety Nine through this film, and you already are learned quite a bit from the spot in this film. So you also have to give some of that build up to the parents in case if one of them does die. Because think about the whole movie, right? Miles wants to save his dad from dying in this canon event, but how are we as the audience supposed to give a shit about his dad dying or not if we don't care about his dad at all? And I think giving him some of that uh, development in these first two movies was for the better rather than the worse, because majority of the people, including myself, have grown some sort of liking or attachment to Miles' dad and his family in general, because we also care about Miles. True. It, it, I don't know. I just felt like there was bigger things at stake. But I get it. It's literally the whole purpose of the movie. But we got like, that later in the first trust, movie, though. Trust me when I say this, though. Yeah. The next film is going to be more OG6, more Spider-Punk, more Miguel. Good. They're probably not going to be as big of a focus or get as much screen time in the third film. The reason why this had to happen is because the whole canon event is about his dad dying. And we, as the audience, have to care about that canon event. Like, whenever Thanos snapped half the world, we had to have a reason to give a shit about him doing that and taking that out half our heroes. That's true. And Miguel isn't a, a villain. He's just being based, all right? Sometimes you just gotta let bad things happen, man. And you can't change that. Oh, and because just... he does have some heroic aspects. But, yeah, obviously, he's not a full-blown hero. I mean, what's up, Ruby? I understand that Michael Hara too. I think he is definitely an anti-hero, but he's like, it, it's a you. You can see the past that he has. Like he went to a different world where his his counterpart died. He went back there to see if he can be a dad and stuff, and destroyed everything. Killed his daughter. Killed every single person in that reality. That breaks a man. That it, it kind of shows in this movie that this thing kind of broke him. And, Kind of made him say, "Have no emotions." That he just wants to make sure this never happens to anyone else. And I think it's brutal to see this, but I'm kind of curious to see what's going to happen in the next movie with Michael Hero if he's going to change his opinion after this whole thing. I will say this: you are correct on that, Berman, because if you look at the after credits in the end of the first Spider Verse. You could tell, like, Miguel, even though he never took his mask off, you could tell he was more full of life. He was coming up with a bit of jokes in a little Spider-Man way. But in this film, like you said, obviously all that time traveling to try to get back with his family, that has taken a toll on him. And I guarantee we're going to learn even more about the guy in the third film than we have in these two films. True. Well, guys... Any last thoughts on this final project? I personally enjoyed it, but when we got to Miles Morales being revealed in the other universe as him becoming the the crawler or prowler, I mean, it 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 was cooking for me, and then it just suddenly stopped. But it's a two parter, so I'll say I'll give it an eight and a half. Still, I'm sure the grade will change once both films come out eventually, but I'm sticking with my eight and a half just for that reason. Well, I'm gonna be. Saying this, I thought the film, in my personal heart, is a 10 out of 10. Objectively, it probably isn't a 10 out of 10, but within my heart, it is a 10 out of 10, so I'm giving it a 10 out of 10. And one thing I want to discuss before I get my rating is that the ending, like, where, well, first, like, Michael Harris says that Spider-Man, that Miles Morales was never supposed to be Spider-Man, that you're not the real, you were never the real Spider-Man, and it was, I think that one kind of broke Miles a lot, I feel like, to thinking that he was never, but then, like, him getting all these, like, people talking to him and thinking, no, I am Spider-Man, and it sounds so good, that train scene, that was a great part, showing that before that, and then the Prowler part, and now that one, he looks so, like, he looks like a bad guy, like, a complete bad guy, in that when he was a prowler that was so interesting to me to see this but for me i will definitely give this a 9.5 i would definitely say if or when i go to uh spider-man sorry miles morales 2 
or three, I would best guess say. This will definitely be a 10 out of 10 for me, but right now, a 9.5 for me. One more thing I'd like to add before we cap off this review is whenever he says you're technically not a real Spider-Man, you want to know the truth? He's right. He's a mistake. Because if you go all the way back in the first film, this the universe Miles that we have was supposed to be a, prowl, a prowler. He was supposed to go in his uncle's direction. He wasn't supposed to go in the Spider-Man direction. And when he had that whole multiversal meeting with Peter when he died the Kingpin, that's what changed everything. And his fate was no longer the Prowler fate. He, it was now the Spider-Man fate. And even if you go back to that first scene when Peter has his spider senses, you can see the colors for Miles at first are green and purple to represent the Prowler. But then it changes to red and blue to represent Spider-Man. Yeah, that's, that's just that's interesting. poetic, man. Well, with that being said, I've been Chris. I've been Batman. And we'll see oh. you. Oh, it, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll see you next time.